I would love to hear from you about your now legendary Leroy McGurk, who was uh, one of your first mentors in the wrestling business, as I yep. understand it. Yeah. And uh, what would become one day the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. Well, you know, uh, Teddy was uh, just an average guy as far as dating and things like that. You know, he just gotten out of college and his first territory was there working for Leroy and Cowboy. So, uh, he had a auspicious start, but along the way he met, uh, Leroy's lovely daughter, Mike, Michael Kathleen McGurk. And, uh, she still, Mike, she did a lot of ring announcing for WWF back in the day. Uh, and uh, really a wonderful lady still around, still beautiful, still lovely and, and nice. So Teddy, uh, be, being young and liking younger ladies, uh, he and Mike, uh, had a relationship. Now the only catch in that ma matter was Leroy had a house rule that his daughter could not, would not date wrestlers, mm. but that kind of fell by the wayside unbeknownst to Leroy, who by the way, was blind. He had, he'd had no sight. And so, uh. One day, uh, we're going to go to Shreveport's Leroy and I, and his Cadillac, I'd never even ridden a Cadillac before. And I was here, I am driving the, the boss, uh, and, uh, Leroy, we got in the car, his Cadillac and headed from Tulsa to Shreveport on a little drive. It's about five hours. I think it was five or six around 300 miles, whatever. And then all of a sudden he, he has a satchel with him, which, you know, just, I figured the satchel was just for essentials. Uh. He had his, uh, coffee can in there. That's what he used as an ashtray because he was, <laughs> it was a big old Folgers coffee, coffee can. And, uh, so he set that in the floor board of the car. And then he reached back into that satchel and pulled out the biggest God dang handgun I've ever seen. It was one of those dirty, hairy Clint Eastwood, you know, type guns. Uh, yes. Big old 38 special or something like something like that. Some exotic thing, <clears throat> but it was a badass gun. And so he took that gun out. Unbeknownst to me, I didn't know why. Uh, and he put it on the, uh, dashboard, the dash of the car. So the more he drank and he was drinking the entire time, uh, he, that he, he would, you know, if he put that gun there and the gun, then if I made a little turn in the road, the gun would slide across the loaded 38, let's say, uh, would slide across the dashboard. And it was disconcerting to say the least a loaded handgun of that magnitude, just running free. And, uh, so I said, Leroy, I, I was curious, obviously, as any young lad would be, what do we, why do we have that gun out? Cause I thought there's something I needed to know. Right. And, uh, he said, well, when we get to Shreveport, you're going to help me kill the million dollar. You're going to help me kill Ted DiBiase. I said, excuse me, sir. You're going to help me kill Ted DiBiase. So I'm thinking, well, this is going to be a good day. <laughs> uh, I can see myself young, bright little face, chubby kid how popular I would be in prison. I'd probably have thousands of cigarette cases. It's just a terrible, I was worried about, I, I saw my life flash before me. I never been exposed to something like this. Right. So nonetheless, uh, we stop at a little along the way at this place. We always stopped at to eat. And I remember very vividly how I had to plan Leroy's meal. Everything was on a clock. So if he ordered fried chicken for lunch, it was at noon. And if he ordered, uh, mashed potatoes with it, it was at three. So everything had a designation had, 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 had a, uh, you know, so that's how, that's how I fed him. Right. And so while he was eating, I slipped away and went to the off to the uh, pay phone. We didn't have cell phones then. I went to the pay phone and I called the office collect. And when you call collect from the road, you always use the name Gene Kaninsky. So it's a collect call from Gene Kaninsky. We accept the charges. And, uh, so I finally got bill on the phone that he was, he was actually in Shreveport waiting on us. And, uh, 
I told him what was going on. And Leroy was drinking. He's, he's going to, he says, he's, we're going to, we are going to kill Ted DiBiase and uh, we're going to do it in Shreveport when tonight, once we arrive, he's dead. So I, uh, told that to cowboy who left, laughed. He thought it was funny. I didn't. And so anyway, we get to Shreveport and, and Leroy says, here's what we're going to do. You're going to set me in front of the door. So when the door opens, it's right in front of me and, uh, I'm going to start shooting and I, I, and you don't need to be there, but you've already done your job. Your job was to get Ted DiBiase to my hotel. And so I don't remember how that went about. I think I saw Grizz, Grizzly Smith or somebody. And, uh, that's how that, that's how the word was going to get to Teddy. Uh, good, good, good. The good news is, is that Teddy never showed up. He was tipped off that there was a plot to kill him and, uh, Leroy and that boy, the kid, which is me, uh, were waiting on him. Like, you know, wait a minute. I ain't fucking waiting on nobody. I drove the man, my boss to work. And along the way, I hear this plan of murder. And so anyway, cowboy comes over and, uh, we put Leroy to bed so he could sleep it off. And we took command of his weapon. So there's never a shot fired, but the intentions were, and I uh, were to kill DiBiase, kill Teddy. And then, uh, it just, it, thank God it never occurred. It never, it never materialized. So that was my little story there about that deal. You know, nice trip to Shreveport, you know, several miles and going to work all this other stuff and my, and my love, my, my dream job, making $125 a week. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't that something? I don't, I don't know. Buck and a quarter all in, you know, there's no expenses on the road. Leroy would pay for things and give me his credit card or give me the cash. And I never cheated him at all. I, I he'd give me money. Says, is that a 20? And it would be a hundred to say, I, I could easily have said, Yes, that's a 20 and kept the change. I never, right. cause I always figured these guys are shady. It's like being in a, in a little, uh, not horribly violent mafia. So maybe they had a, had a plan to see, to, to test me. So the good news is don't cheat. Don't lie, especially to your bosses or anybody else. Just, you don't need to remember. I don't need to have to think about what I told somebody. That's right. If I, if I told them the truth and you're in, you're good. So anyway, that was where that story came from. And it's a pretty famous story in that respect. I use it in one man shows several times. Always gets a good laugh, good, inter interesting. Uh, and if I'm drinking and, uh, I might be a little more colorful than here today on this, on this platform, but it was a hell of a, hell of a deal. I, I had 300 miles to think about going to prison for murder and it wasn't cool for a, you know, that was, I was 22 years old.